Good morning. Welcome to the James True Show. It's so good to be here. It's been a while. I've been uh, prepping this thing for you. I trust audio is good. It seems like it is. I'm going to take these out now and trust that everything, I'm not going to hit any buttons and everything's going to be good. I really want you guys to hear today's show. And uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, bringing your witness. And uh, it's been raining like a mofo. The trees have just been crazy. And uh, the town, for an entire year, the experts were here telling me, that's not a leak, that's not a leak. James, you have no idea what you're doing. You you don't run a town water department. How could you know that that all this water that's been here in your driveway for a year is is is, is a leak from us? And that's exactly what you were going through every day right as you uh try and make it through the needle forest right all of us are indiana jones we have stolen the golden idol (laughs) we have seen the truth and we've stuck in the bag and we are fucking running out of that cave for that giant gonad rolling at us through the spider webs yeah speaking of webs let's do this thing uh Reality terrorism, that's the word. Melanie and I came up with that last night. Reality terrorism. And I don't, I don't mean this is a joke. We, we're, I was just literally trying to think of a better way to describe what, what, what we researched. And the word's reality terrorism. Let's just do it. A ruler. I'm going to make sure everybody can hear me. I don't see anybody complaining. Good. Thank you, Debbie. Perfect, Debbie. Right there. All right. There's the, Okay. A ruler's most precious resource is attention. On the day of the bin Laden raid, uh, the, the, the president and his national security team piled into this very tiny conference room within the Situation Room complex to monitor the raid as it happened. I chose one corner of the room uh, to be in, there, and, and because there were so many people, I couldn't really Uh, move around during uh, those 40 minutes. And so I was able to photograph as they all watched uh, this raid unfold. Uh, There was very little conversation taking place. There was just observation as they uh, watched the special forces on the ground. When the president walked into this little conference room, there was a brigadier general sitting at the head of the table and he stood up to give the president that chair and, and uh, the president said, no, 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 you stay there because he was on his laptop in communication with, um, uh, the, uh, with Admiral McRaven. And the president just pulled up a folding black chair and sat next to him. This photo is so cool, right? You're, you're looking at... <clears throat> In, in reality television world, you're looking at the world's most cutting-edge leaders with the most cutting-edge military, with the most cutting-edge intelligence information, with the most cutting-edge equipment, the most cutting-edge trained people in the most dangerous parts of the world, rooting out the most dangerous, evilest part of global terrorism that you've ever seen. And things are so so tense that Hillary Clinton has her hands over her mouth and that the dude with the computer gets the lead chair. And it's real. That's that's real. This is not a scene where these people make it up. This is... Okay, Hillary's... But she's kind of a sociopath, so you could argue she believes this stuff. But I want you to know that everyone in this room thinks that they're hunting someone. And they are. And someone in this room, at least one person in this room, knows everything that's happening here. And it's a small majority. It's a very small majority. And the one person in the room is the last person you would ever suspect. That's her. Her name is redacted. Her photo is redacted. Glenn Greenwald 
is the only person who actually identified her, you are not going to be able to find a photo of this woman on any national media source or site. She's unnamed. And she's the only one in the room who knows exactly what's going on. Alfreda Francis Bukowski, born 1965, is a Central Intelligence Agency officer who has headed the Bin Laden Issue Station and the Global Jihad Unit. Bukowski's identity is not publicly acknowledged by the agency, but was deduced by independent investigative journalists in 2011. In January, that was Glenn Greenwald. In January 2014, the Washington Post named her and tied her to a pre-9/11 intelligence failure and the extraordinary rendition of Khalid El Masari. The Senate Intelligence Committee report on CIA torture released on December 2014 showed that Bukowski was not only a key part of the torture program, but also one of its chief apologists, resulting in the media's giving her the moniker, the unidentified queen of torture. Bukowski married her former boss, Michael Schur, in December 2014. That's this guy. Schur and Bukowski were reality terrorist producers. Their job was to produce reality terrorism. She would produce torture. He would produce blame. And you were looking at a witch finder general couple. And this is an advanced show today, meaning that I'm going to require that the prerequisite be the Pied Piper of War, the Frequency of War live stream that we've done. Um, that's why I've told everyone, hey, this is a really important episode. Very, very important. Because you're looking at the exact same notes being played in the exact same way. And instead of it being 2-4 time or 4-4 four, four time, you're looking at narrative. You're looking at the invention of reality television. And this guy is a producer. Not only is he a producer, I think that he actually caught a sadist <laughs> and decided he would marry her and she would be protected as long as she joined him in the in these in his business. I can't prove that. Of course, she's redacted anyway. This dude Michael produced Inside 9-11, National Geographic special, nominated for an Emmy, um, considered the primary source story for what happened. It was broken down into three parts. Of course, one of those parts doesn't even mention Building 7. Just doesn't come up. Rated by the Enemy Committee as the most thorough and accurate documentary ever produced by National Geographic, there highest rated program ever that same guy orchestrated the story of Zacharias Masawi and Abel Danger and if your attention span is short which is completely understandable when you're watching news you may think oh well this is progress and we're we're knocking them out one by one and it's going to look like a serial, like Charlie's Angels, like uh, The Bionic Man, like Law and Order, like uh, Pubic Hair Chase Show, right? Number seven. It's these reality shows evolve so much to where reality terrorism became a thing. My own archive, for example, on which the book was based, contains over 175 primary source documents, numbering over 800, 840 pages. This is a significant amount of material, and yet the only reasonable claim that I can make about my own archive is that I hold only the documents I found to date, and surely not all that exist. Given this body of primary sources, it is odd that so few of them have been exploited by Western political leaders writers and analysts who have spoken on the bin Laden issue or produced books meant to explain who bin Laden is and what he is up to. To date, works on bin Laden, with a few notable exceptions, especially Peter Bergen's splendid book, 
the Osama bin Laden I know, have been based in the main on what other individuals have said about him and not what he has himself said and done. For you to understand this show, I need you to look at bin Laden as a Maltese falcon, as a, as a prop. It is a very important prop. And you working in the CIA would either introduce a new prop, which requires a lot of calories and leverage, because you have to insert that new prop into the American mind, which takes money, it takes influence, it takes uh, inserting stories into the AP and the Reuters. It's not that hard. There's a protocol for it. You even fill out a form. But if you're in the CIA and your department wants to introduce a new prop, you are going to have to spend most of your budget bribing or buying or purchasing or planting or creating, excuse me, a narrative. If you don't have that kind of money, if you're nimble and you're fast, you can just take an existing prop that's already on the field. Uh, the Joey Buttafuoco is a Maltese falcon with the penis cut off. It's, it's uh, Bin Laden is a Maltese falcon with a bomb. Mother Teresa is a Maltese falcon wearing, a, wearing one of those flying nun hats, right? You, as a CIA operative, could use these pieces, much like chess, and install or carry out whatever op you've been told to carry out based on these players on the field. And when you are employed at the CIA, you will not know who's a player and who's not. In fact, you will notice that that gnosis is a commodity. And that commodity, the more things that you know, even though you know them, <laughs> you can't even prove that you know them to most people. There's only going to be a few times when you're going to be able to do that. So even when you know something, no one's going to believe you because this is who you are. Now, if you didn't catch what Michael just said, he's explaining... I, he's so boring, I'm not going to, because he sounds so official. By the way, this is at the World Affairs Council, and not once does the World Affairs Council ever admit or say, even in their description, even though this has already been publicized, that this man was completely embedded with the queen, the unidentified queen of torture. It doesn't disclose that he's married to her. It doesn't disclose anything that, that she and him were collectively working under this umbrella, this prop, this, this uh, Maltese falcon called Bin Laden. And I'm not going to be able to tell you who invented Bin Laden. That's not going to happen here. You guys know about embracing mystery, so you know that the only way that you're ever going to be able to even have this conversation is you're going to have to be comfortable not knowing who's what. But I'm going to clearly show you how it works and why it's so obvious that you can see it. But to see it, I need you to A, realize you're not going to know exactly who's who as I describe this. And B, it's not going to be comfortable because this isn't a sitcom that's going to be wrapped up. There's not going to be an I-dotting or a T-crossing because that's how Black Ops works. If you remember from the Edible Propaganda episode, we described the three different types. Please go back and watch that. But we described the three different types of noise or propaganda, right? Black, white, and gray. White is, here's my source, check it out. Gray is, sources. is... It's not, it's, it's hidden. It's not mentioned. Most of the time it's not mentioned, but sometimes it's just obfuscated. Uh, black source is a source that's been purposely uh, rendered as something else. Uh, it's, it's purposely hidden. So it's not the same as gray. It's not where it's not hidden. It's that it's purposely placed as something else to mislead you. And a lot of people will confuse gray and black all the time. But if you use the energy equations that we've discussed for over a year now, you can see how 
a a story with a black source is showing a weakness. The narrative has a weakness if you find out it has a black source or if you know it has a black source. If the narrative has a gray source, it has an inherent strength. The reason I'm saying this is because in order for all these different sources to be sold to the mind, picture your mind as it truly is, an electromagnetic field, and picture ideas trying to penetrate, and that a gray source is simply an EMF signal that's able to penetrate you without having a, uh, a surrogate that you can trust. The surrogate, the white source, is you saying, Oh, I know, I know Bob down in accounting. He's a straight up shooter, that guy. Yes, if he tells you that that I that I didn't pay enough for this, then here, let me let me settle up for that right now. The white source creates the opening in the bubble for the information to come in and you accept it as true. So by looking at these sources themselves, you're able to de divine, not to find, you're able to divine, this is the big difference, not to find, but divine what the intention was, why something was bled through. This is so confusing if you're looking for straight answers. This is why people tend to gravitate towards the news. It's a more of a salt lick. I've got my salt here. But it's deeply embedded inside of these heavy, complex carbohydrates that are going to have to digest with you for years to come, for days to come, maybe not years. Hope my analogy works. We'll just see if it does. <laughs> As you see in this video, he's describing 800 pages of source uh, and people are ignoring it. That's what he's saying. That the people you're hearing information about Obama, is what he's saying, is not the information that I want you to hear. He is banking on selling his information. The 800 pages, he probably wrote most of that. In fact, he says that. That's why people herald him as the expert, because he was able to write down words on paper. And those words had that white source... Why was it a white source? Because he had a title. That's why. Look. Chief, CIA. Chief. Holy shit, he's already kicking ass. Osama bin Laden tracking unit. Holy mother. Look at the white source on this guy, right? Counterterrorism center. Man. It's the same propagation. It's the same contagion. It's exactly the same. He painted a picture of the most beautiful terrorist you could ever see. 1992 Yemen bombing on troops. 1993 World Trade Center bombing. 1995 Riyadh bombing. 1996, Iran bombing. 1998, Somalia helicopter airstrike. And the 1998, embassy bombings. And he didn't just create those events. And remember what I said earlier? When I say create, the simple thinker will say, so... He did all these, or he created these events, and the answer is no. He only has so much of a budget. And I would submit to you that the World Trade Center bombing was already done. And that the Yemen bombing on troops was probably already done too. And same with Riyadh. And to be completely frank, I don't know if Somalia was an airstrike. It could have been a helicopter that just crashed. It, it, it really could have been uh, 
a crashed helicopter. Helicopters crash a lot in the desert. In fact, one of the things that, that really fucked us up in Iraq, we say fucked us up, was the fact that the diameter of sand is so small <laughs> that it actually uh, will render the helicopter engine useless. But it's a completely different topic. The point I'm trying to make is, is that what Michael does is he weaves stories. He stitches these things together as best he can. And if he's able to paint a good enough picture linking all these things to one central boogeyman, Michael has a commodity now. He has a product. He's the expert of bin Laden. He has the white source cloak around him. And now he's able to physically take that prop that was either on the stage before him or he created, again, you're not going to know, and physically leverage it in a certain direction to get what he wants. And when you see people praising him, giving him acolytes, what you're really seeing is people publicly telling him, hey man, I really want to help back up your psyop. I want to invest. That's what it is. I'm investing in you, Michael, because I'm going to go on Nightline and I'm going to talk about the brilliant work that the CIA just did under the direction of Shure and linking the World Trade Center to Riyadh, to Iran, to Somalia, to the embassy, to Yemen. And that if that sells, that piece becomes higher profit. What happens with property? Location, location, location. What happens with PSYOP? Story, story, story. This is the invention of reality terrorism. And these are producers. We begin with the story of a shadowy multimillionaire who has declared a holy war against the United States. To some in the Islamic world, he is a hero. To the United States government, though, he is a terrorist, a real threat to the lives of U.S. troops. He is Osama bin Laden. And Impact's Peter Arnett takes us into his hideaway and into his mind with this first ever television interview. Amidst these remote mountains of Afghanistan are the various hiding places of one of the world's most wanted men. Osama bin Laden. We declared a jihad, a holy war, against the United States government because it is unjust, criminal and tyrannical. The U.S. State Department calls him one of the most significant financial sponsors of Islamic extremism in the world. Uh, he is a major terrorist financier and with a large fortune of his own, he has bankrolled terrorist groups and individuals all over the world. The State Department links the 41-year-old bin Laden to Ramzi Youssef, alleged mastermind of the World Trade Center bombing, New York. An attempted bombing of U.S. troops in 1992, Yemen. Terrorist training camps in Sudan and Afghanistan. Islamic terrorist groups in Egypt and Algeria. Younger generation Islamic, especially those uh, Islamic fundamentalists, uh, they are looking for a hero. And Mr. Bin Laden fit the bill. In Western intelligence circles, Bin Laden is best known for this document, a call for jihad or holy war against the thousands of U.S. soldiers now stationed in Saudi Arabia. That call to jihad came after two bombings of U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia. The first in Riyadh in 1995, seven dead. The second in Dahran in 1996. Oh, oh, wait. Phones on. Better answer this. Uh, CNN. Yeah, this is Officer uh, Special Agent Mark... Dicklin, we're with the FBI, and we're uh, just got a report that you actually did a live television interview with Osama bin Laden. Is that correct, please? Uh, yes, yes, it is. 
Uh, sir, he's the, seriously listed in the top 10 most deadly people ever in the world on the terrorist list. As far as just most dangerous people in digitally, he's on Interpol as the most wanted. Mossad considers him the most dangerous man in the world. And you doing an interview with him, well, we're going to have to uh, bring you down here, do a disposition so we can find out his whereabouts. Yeah, see, we have this... Uh uh, journalistic integrity over here, because we're CNN, and uh, there's no way that we would ever collude with the government to bring down a terrorist and save millions of Americans' lives. I think this is, quite frankly, very insulting of you to ever suspect that someone like CNN with our journalistic integrity would ever succumb to such a such a horrible request, sir. I am frankly offended, and I find this very, very un-American. Uh, yeah, okay, we're going to have to... Get, get back to you on that. June 10th, 1998. He may have backed the bombers who attacked the World Trade Center. Weapons which he supplied shot down U.S. helicopters in Somalia. He applauded the bombings of U.S. bases in Saudi Arabia. American forces have now gone to a higher level of alert because he's threatened new attacks on U.S. targets. We believe that the biggest thieves in the world are Americans and the biggest terrorists on earth are the Americans. Tonight, he's rich, well-educated, and by his own description... Oh, the phone's ringing. Uh, ABC, can I help you? Yeah, this is Special Agent uh, Dirk Dickhead. Uh, look, we just got a report that uh, you did a live interview with Osama bin Laden in person. Can you confirm, please? Uh, yes, that's correct. We sure did. Yeah, we're going to need you to come down and take a deposition because, you see, he happens to be the most wanted man in the world. He's responsible for, like, a shitload of terrorism. And it's kind of fucked that you didn't call us. So, come on down. Uh, yeah, that's... that's We have this thing called journalistic integrity, and uh, we don't think that the government would ever collude with us as media, so this entire thing is just frankly insulting. And how dare you, sir? How dare you think that the government and the media would ever, ever, ever collude? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to get back to you on that, so... Guys, OBL was the most wanted man in the world. Not only was he the most wanted man in the world, but we, as a collective nation, had psychosis and pretended that 12... <laughs> 12 opportunities where he was interviewed and we missed every one of them and you and I have this cloud that makes us think well it's because they're separate see cause hey man news you know it's a slippery slope James once news starts working with the government to save people's lives it's gonna be this whole slippery slope next thing you know people might not trust the media they might actually think we're not on the up and up. And, and, and you, can, you can be mad at them, but I need you to understand the psychosis it requires for you to be sitting at home watching this shit on TV and saying, man, God, if we didn't have freedom of the press, we could have gotten him. Man, God, they gave us the slip. God, I, I don't know what's going to happen now. And no one questions a high-profile target with 12 primetime network interviews and a movie deal. Yes, a movie deal, my friends. Not only a movie deal, a movie deal that won three Academy Awards. The true story of Black Hawk Down, 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 down. 
Academy Award for Best Sound Mixing. Yeah, that's f- fucking rich, right? Academy Award for Best Film Editing. Golden Reel Award for Outstanding Achievement. And you're watching, what is an Oscar but a Golden Idol? What is the CIA but the creator of idols? Right? The Maltese Falcon? Shiny and gold, it would be your, your prop of good? And Osama bin Laden, right? The prop of evil. It doesn't matter. The power of the peace on the field is going to be based on the amount of white sourcing everyone gives it. The amount of belief we give it. That's what news is. News is rumors coming to you that you will choose or not choose to believe based on their frequency, their vibration, and the host who sent it to you. That all three of those things are what you use to discern. And you're not going to know. Neither am I. I wanted to show you all the stuff on him with Russia and his CIA connections. But guys, you're still not going to know. You're not. And I'm going to be forced having to show you interviews with his brother. And the whole time you're like, dude, who the fuck knows? You, You don't. And it doesn't matter. Because when you're looking for who knows, something's very important. When you're looking for who knows, you're making an assumption it's true. You're making an assumption that all these things are true. You're making an assumption that Black Hawk Down wasn't because of the particles of sand that got into the engine. This is what happened with Jimmy Carter. Or we think what happened. We don't know. You cannot trust these people. Because they wouldn't have jobs if you could. That's not how three-letter agencies work. I know you guys get this. I want to bring this point home, though. That while we're pretending that, that media and government can never collude, I want you to right now try and find a picture of Alfreda Francis Bukowski. Google it. And you're going to see every single major network redacting her photo, not showing you. I don't even know if that's her name. And to really emphasize this, go to Russian television, RT. If we're pretending that that countries are real (laughs) and we're pretending that governments are real, then I need you to do the due diligence, if you doubt this, and go to Russian television and do a search for her name and then try and come back here and explain which is going to be hard because it's a one-way show, but put it in the chat or the comments. But to come back to me and explain why Russia would be like, well, you know, sure, she's the queen of torture, and sure, we're in a nuclear uh, winter war with America, and sure, that we are on the verge of dismantling each other's uh, elections, we're stealing data from each other, we're, we're, we're undermining the fundamental principles of democracy itself, but, but we would... We would never want to disclose a, a CIA agent of our enemies. That would, be, that would be so dumb. Do it. Do it. Because you're, you're going to see the veil fall. And as soon as it falls, you're going to get cold. Because you're going to be naked. But it's okay. Three deep breaths. You're going to actually find that the jungle is a beautiful place. It is. It is. Nipples are hard. I don't know why I said that. Two independent countries in bitter contention both quietly agree to censor photos of the Queen of Torture television. Mm, what is this? Is this a blank slide? If it's not, sorry, I need to check because if it's not, yeah, it's not. Okay, good. Whew, glad I checked. So we started playing these games on TV. We started inventing Cards, right? It's the deck of the most wanted terrorists in the world. And we picture this idea of all these rednecks spread across the South. I'm from the South, I can say that. Uh, playing poker over a, a barbecue. Throwing cards at the most wanted terrorists in the world. America! Then we got our rack. We got Sodom. We got him. We got them all. I got the whole collection. Every one of them. Right? 
and these are props. These are the Maltese Falcons, and each of them are competing, and they're even showing you their rating. They're even showing you their uh, follower count. These are follow counts. And if you're a new CIA operative and you have a budget and you and you are on a shoestring, you are going to say, oh my God. Oh my God. It's Adam Gadahan. Holy shit, man. That guy worked at Subway seven years ago and you're off. You're off to the races now. You're good to go. And you can connect this dot with that dot with that dot with that dot. Look at the conspiracy that the last time I did a report on, they, they took my video down and I was actually debunking it. Look at all these experiences. Look at what Breitbart puts out. Look at what was Pizzagate. What was Pizzagate but this? Guys, this is Pizzagate too. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And only now, through listening to what I'm saying, does it really start to ring home that for six decades now, America has its ass constantly and continually kicked by people wearing sandals from the Viet Cong to the Taliban. It just keeps going. Or box cutters. Fricking box cutters from Staples. Or a cosplay Viking with two neck beards. Love these guys, by the way. These guys, I think that these two are freaking rad as hell. I just, I love these guys. You could do a whole, whole sitcom with them. I'm telling you. We'd learn a lot. Maybe the reason why the trade, the same trade center property keeps getting bombed is because the site is used for psychological operations. Have you ever considered that? Have you ever considered that the richest, most powerful family in the world wanted to have fun, wanted to help the world, and not only would they uh, sell them all petroleum, oil, <laughs> but other parts of them would do other things too. And that there is a splintering inside every family, just as there is a splintering inside of every three-letter agency, where children and their parents are diametrically opposed. And I don't need you to embrace or to like someone that you hate. I think having a Maltese falcon of someone you hate is important. I'm not trying to take that away from you. But I'm trying to get you to see that maybe the reason why the same property is bombed for terrorism when the entire time... All it took was a fucking cosplay Viking to take out the White House. That they didn't choose the White House because they didn't have the budget. I am here to tell you that if a CIA program had enough budget, they could de detonate the White House. They could detonate the White House and blame it on whoever they wanted. And it would be an investment. An investment. You would be investing in this Maltese Falcon. And in exchange for your investment, you are going to be named in certain parts of the story, either as the hero or the villain. And that the person that's named would also be another Maltese Falcon that you've had at play for years. And you as a small CIA PSYOP operative is going to use your cleverness at playing Othello, at playing chess, to take the smallest Maltese Falcon that you have, your your piece, and use it to either uh, destroy the gearing of something larger, which is very, very rare in the CIA. More than likely, it will be to add your Maltese onto the coattails of another and allow the first one to go, knowing that it will bring your Maltese Falcon that much more value later. Location, 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 but in the mind. Do you see? in the heart terrorism is reality television with location do you understand 
It's with location. Stuff's so easy once you see it. And when you can look at it that way, things start to make sense. When I say make sense, they're still retarded, don't get me wrong. They're still crazy. But every motivation has math now. This is Khalid al-Masri, a man who was famously said, I could not possibly prove my innocence because I did not know what I was being charged with. The CIA uh, detained him and said, well, no, actually it turns out he didn't do anything wrong. Moreover, the, in, in the terrorism report that not only... Sorry, let me just read this. Moreover, the report found that after quickly concluding that he was not a terrorist, agents decided to detain him on the grounds they knew he was bad. This guy was taken to a... Um, well, actually, we'll get there. This guy uh, also came out and said, yeah, uh, he was not physically abused at all during his detention. And even though he claims that he was shackled, beaten, injected with drugs, force fed, and sodomized, and even though the European Court of Human Rights agrees, the CIA is still, part of them are still saying, no, no, that didn't happen. Now, that dude was claimed to be taken to, I say claimed, let's just say he was taken there, to the Cobalt and Salt Pit. Cobalt and Salt Pit are two CIA black sites in Afghanistan. And just by showing this picture, that's all it took, this picture, the intelligence community, all the media, believes that, yes, this is it. The CIA was doing horrible things here, and, and Americans who took this picture weren't able to actually get into the American base where this was, that it was somehow an Afghan farmer who took this photo and showed it, and that the reason why it's far away is not to... <laughs> Uh, not because it would have been death for someone in America with a camera to go into the American Bay dead. This is a black site. And that the only way I can sell this Maltese Falcon of this being cobalt or salt pit is with a picture that's purposely ambiguous. The picture gives you the feeling of black ops. Why? Because you don't know. First of all, why would you put a black ops site at the bottom of a very large hill? All right. Doesn't mean it's not true. As I said before, you're not going to know what's true or not, guys. But if you use your discernment and use salaciousness as a fucking radar, you will see what I'm talking about. Not all of you are going to get this episode, and that's okay. I don't want you all. I only want the ones that understand. I'm not trying to convince anyone because this shit is real. And it's the only thing that does the math. The prana economies wedge perfectly when you see how this works, that the biggest mistake you will make about the CIA is thinking that they are a single entity with a single thought. It doesn't work that way. Different people enter the CIA all the time. Those people are only going to be given jobs based on the program that has money for their position. That's it. That's it. That's the only thing holding them together. There's no cohesion. There's no... All right, there is an oath. But these guys don't meet over hot dogs and go, are we doing good? Are we still doing good? Hey, tell me all your shit and I'll tell you all my shit so we can make sure we're legit. It, it doesn't work that way. That's how you lose your job. The reason why I bring up Khalid El Masri, before we get into this, I should say, this dude, Masri, the reason why this story is so obvious to me, first of all, it's from the Queen of Torture, so it's even confirmed, but keep in mind what confirms means. But this guy's story says that they got him because they misspelled his name, which, first of all, doesn't sound accurate at all. That doesn't sound right to me. Secondly, they claimed, well, the reason why all this got out it's because, yeah, we were sodomizing him. Yeah, we knew he didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, we flew him to a foreign country so we could torture him. Yeah, we tortured him. And all that we're good with. But James, he refused to eat. And as we were there sodomizing him, we noticed that he wasn't eating his Cheerios. And the pain of knowing that he wasn't eating was so great that we had to blow the whistle. And his hunger strike, man. This dude went on hunger strike and it's what saved his life. 
Jerry, tell him the story. Yeah, man, I was just freaking digging him back there and noticed his stomach was growling. And I was like, I can't do this. Look, this is cruel, man. If you don't give him a candy bar, I'm not going to sodomize him. That is what you were told. And that story is what introduced three more Maltese Falcons. And one of those Maltese Falcons was in the killing room. A known sadist was in the killing room. Why is she a known sadist? Let me back up. If this is true, who the fuck knows? And all the books that have been written about this, about this issue, the Queen of Torture, um, she's not an interrogator. The reason why she's called a Queen of Torture is because she was always flying to these black op sites to participate in the torture. She would delay torture because she wanted to be there. She had no uh, justification for being there. She just said, I really just want to be in the room. Oh, by the way, 3,000 detainees were exposed in this op. This is, this is, oh, this is so hard to follow, guys. Please bear with me here. But El Masar, Masri, let's say that all of, all of what happened to him was a lie. Let's say all of what's true. It doesn't matter. Let's say it was bad. Let's say it's evil. It doesn't matter because I want you to know how this game works. At the end of the day, this op ended up exposing that 3,000 people were being detained who shouldn't be. Maybe it wasn't 3,000. Maybe it was four, maybe it was 19, maybe it was zero, maybe it was 30,000. You're not going to know. Remember what we talked about? You're not going to know, which is why news is so comfortable, because they're always zipping it up. You're not going to know. But I want you to keep in your mind that a CIA op that exposes itself and makes its own people look bad could be a CIA op that's actually a good op. And that it could be that all that this entire Maltese Falcon, Khalid al Masri, was actually a good psyop to get you to see that we are interrogating 3,000 people with anal penetration because we spelled their name wrong. And I don't need you to believe that's true. I need you to hear that someone in the CIA spent a lot of money and time on publishing that idea to you. And that we as readers embrace that idea. And instead of us saying, hey, the CIA is fucked up. Do you know what we did? We took Haskell. Glenn Haskell, the lady that replaced uh, this guy as a CIA. And decided, oh, well, she's fixed it all. Because she uncovered this, she fixed it all. Meanwhile, the queen of torture herself, the woman who's been redacted from every photo is actually in the war room, the closest, most tight-knit place there is, the closest to the president's ear as you can be, during the killing of Osama bin Laden. It's bullshit. And bullshit is only going to stand when you stake it with truth, which is why so many people fail to see this stuff. They fail to see because of how caloric it is to keep track of all this shit. It's everywhere. This is Gary Bernston. Bernston. Writer of Jawbreaker. I'm under the impression that this guy is what you would call like a patriotic American who entered the CIA, got a job, got promoted, and um, wasn't connected to any black ops. This guy is like the naive... Uh, the naive soldier that's working inside of a CIA op. I could be wrong. You guys might even discover in the comments how wrong I am because later this and this and this and this. So please know, I don't know if I'm right. I don't. But I get the feeling that this is right because you'll see. He already felt we, the CIA, missed an opportunity at Tora Bora to get him. Who's him? Bin Laden. We put resources elsewhere. I didn't trust anyone on the seventh floor, the CIA. In 2001, I had been selected by CIA's Counterterrorism Center to lead the Jawbreaker team, which was the primary team that would lead the invasion 
of Afghanistan after the attacks of 9-11. Uh, I have been given instructions to accomplish a, a series of things. Number one was destroy the Taliban because they wouldn't surrender bin Laden. Uh, number two was to destroy al-Qaeda as an organization. And then, of course, finally, eliminate bin Laden. We would initially land and position ourselves in the Panjshir, coordinate with the Northern Alliance from there, and, of course, very rapidly we were able to seize the city of Kabul. But we realized that bin Laden had fled south to the White Mountains. He'd moved along the road in a massive group. There were about 750 to 1,000 people with him. The whole quote could be reduced to 750 to 1,000 people with him. We'll get to that in a second. Um, this guy actually wants to catch a bin Laden. Why would he not? The amount of hero accolades, the Maltese Falcon, right? If he's to find the Maltese Falcon, he uh, some of these characters on the stage that could be used by the CG, uh, CIA could be organic and some could be manufactured. It really doesn't matter. Because whether they're organic or manufactured doesn't necessarily even mean that they're true or false, right? Those two don't don't correlate either. In two thousand, so sorry, it's the same thing. I had been selected by CIA's counterterrorism center. You know, at no point were there more than sixty Americans there. There were more journalists at that battle than Americans. Do you you know, that? at no point were there more than 60 Americans there. There were more journalists at that battle than Americans. There were more journalists at that battle than Americans. If you don't know what that battle is, um, he explained that he was going... Oh, I bet you that's what you missed. Uh, Bernstein explained that he would be given no troops. He would be given no support by the army. He was going to have to do this alone. So he says, I'm going to go in alone. This is the giant bomb you saw where they said, we tried to kill Osama with a giant bomb. And they picked the largest bomb they had because that makes the most press, the most boom you could possibly have. And in the one operation we had to get Osama bin Laden here in this instance, there were no more than 60 troops. No more than that. There were more journalists. There were more media people there because they'd been told we're going to set off a bomb than there were troops. This is not catching someone. This is announcing, this is putting out a press release to other press saying we are going to be detonating a bomb to capture Osama bin Laden during the most secretive, in the most, in the, in the enemy territory. You know, at no point where there are more than 60 okay. Americans. Has trouble skipping over sometimes. True American hero sitting across the table from me here today. So if you don't recognize this face, let me tell you who he is. So this is Robert O'Neill. And um, we've had a lot of sports people on here, a lot of entertainers that in most people's minds are heroes. And then in life you meet a real hero. Um, he doesn't consider himself one, but he is one. And so let me give him the proper introduction just so you know who this man is. 52 decorations in the military, two silver stars, four bronze star medals with valor, joint service commendation medal with valor, three presidential unit citations, two Navy, Marine and Navy Corps combinations with valor, service, 400 different combat missions, 400. Um, if you've watched the movie Captain Phillips, this is the first guy onto the boat um, when the Somali pirates had that boat. If you've watched Lone Survivor, with uh, Marcus Luttrell. He was on that recovery mission. And by the way, <clears throat> he also killed Osama bin Laden. And so thank you for being here. I appreciate that. And like you mentioned too, it's not a hero thing. I was very fortunate to be with um, incredible teams. Of course. And he was, he's a hero. Not only is he a hero, but two movies were written about him before he even killed Osama bin Laden. <laughs> two. So before you even get to Black Hawk Down, there's two other movies. Big, big, big blockbusters. Captain Phillips with none other... Damn it! Sorry. <laughs> Captain Phillips <laughs> with none other than Tom Hanks. 
and Lone Survivor with Mark Wahlberg. Let's see what those earned. That was uh, October. Guess what? These two movies were both released in two months of each other. Two months. Sorry, I can't show you that, but you see that? There's the notes there. Uh, damn it. <laughs> um, there we go. October 11th, 2013 was Captain Phillips. It had 50 nominations. And December 25th, 2013, 154 million for Lone Survivor. It did not have 50 nominations. I don't want to share. Dang it, James. I don't want to share. Now you're giving away all my staff's email addresses. Damn it. I will fix that later. I'm so sorry, guys. Fuck. Okay. Chief White House Correspondent Jake Tapper. And Jake, you've learned more about uh, laying Osama bin Laden's body to rest at sea and, and how that was transported, how that uh, was, was uh, fulfilled. And what can you tell us about that? Well, first of all, David, uh, just in the last few seconds, administration officials have told me uh, that there, the DNA uh, evidence uh, has come back and there is a 99.9% .9 certainty uh, that the body is Osama bin Laden's essentially uh, proving uh, that this was Osama bin Laden. Uh, Osama bin Laden's corpse was taken uh, by the troops uh, to the aircraft carrier, the USS Carl Vinson. Uh, the, he was uh, buried at sea according to uh, Muslim tradition. There was a Muslim seaman uh, who was there uh, and they wrapped him and said the prayers according. Uh Hi, I'm a Muslim seaman. I was uh, there. Yeah, the world's most dangerous terrorist. I'm the eyewitness. So we were going to bring the body back and like test it and do DNA and stuff and maybe even use the body to like negotiate something, you know, with the other terrorists. But we were kind of there on the boat and they were like, hey, Muslims, they always want to be murdered and then take it on an aircraft carrier and then buried at sea. That's the Muslim tradition. And everyone, of course, looked at me and I was like, yeah, that is a tradition. This is a pickle, a real quandary here. So, yeah, that's what happened, uh, Jake. That's exactly what what happened uh, to what is uh, part of the Islamic tradition, the idea being not to inflame the Muslim world uh, in any way. Right? Yeah, because you know, if you kill their leader of the most terrorist organization in the world, you might inflame them because there would be terrorists there who'd be mad. So the key is you don't kill him. You just murder him and bury his body at sea. Yeah. Right now, White House officials are fiercely debating whether or not they should release a photograph of bin Laden's corpse. Uh, those in, arguing in favor say it needs to be done to rest assure, uh, to, to rest aside any concerns, any skepticism that this did not happen. But I'm also told by somebody who has seen the photograph, it is a gruesome photograph uh, with bin Laden had taking a bullet wound uh, above his left eye. It is a photograph that has brains and blood in it. And so those are the, uh, the issues being debated right now. James. They got him. They killed him. No, they, they didn't actually. They never actually showed a body. James, they got him. They killed him. There was photographs. There were brains. You, you saw it. It was, it, was, it was right above the eye. He got shot in the eye. They had to throw him out at sea. James, they're seagulls. Seagulls are pecking at his body. It's, it's not safe. Someone could get sick. There could be some sort of like viral outbreak as a result of his body being eaten by seagulls after he was shot. You saw the photographs. Yeah, the Jake Tapper, he just he just said, I saw it on Jake Tapper. I saw it. I saw it, I'm telling you. This is not hard. Selling these stories. And and you might think to an amateur, you'd be like, How am I gonna convince everybody that we don't have a body and we're not gonna have a body and we're not gonna have a photograph and none of us can prove it? How am I gonna convince that? They're, they're not sweating. Cause they're like, no problem. You need a hero, you need three movies, and in the middle of explaining why we you're gonna blame it on Muslim sensitivity. And in the middle of explaining that, you're going to cut in with breaking news about his DNA. Did you notice that? In the middle 
of the time where you think Jake Tapper is going to say, why the fuck did they not bring the body back? There's a, we interrupt this newscast to tell you that the DNA evidence is in and it's 99.999% sure that it's Bin Laden. And that's it. That's it. And people are going to remember, I saw the photographs. Why? Because he told you. He told you to see them. He described them for you. Do you know how it worked? Because he used white sourcing. He's white sourcing you and he's telling you, I saw the photographs. I'm at the White House. I'm wearing a fucking tie. I've got three letters alphabetically arranged, in fact, backing me up here. And they were gruesome. They're so gruesome. They're in there right now debating whether or not they should show them to you. I, Hey, I'm here for you guys. So, you know, I didn't judge. But, mm, it was really not, not something mm, you'd want to see. That's it. This is reality terrorism. It writes itself. It's no different than if you throw a chair into the wrestling ring, you're good. You can go to the bathroom now. You can take a pee break. Why? Because you know when you get back, there's going to be something about a chair. Or someone's going to be mad about what happened when a chair was introduced. And that's it. You're there. Right? This shitbag, David Sanger, he's the one who tried to tell you the Taliban has got a nuclear weapon. He wrote a book, just like David Shure did. Just like him, he wanted to be a producer too, and he wanted to introduce to you the story of Confront and Conceal, New York Times bestseller about how the Taliban had a nuclear bomb. Now, that Maltese doesn't play, which is why you don't hear a lot of nuclear stuff anymore. People are just kind of like, yeah, whatever. Creating these things is an art. You need a Joey Buttafuoco. You need that placement to insert itself so deeply that it resonates for decades and decades. Why did Joey Buttafuoco resonate? Because a woman was assaulted and she cut off his dick. That's all it takes. It doesn't take photos. It doesn't take eyewitnesses. It doesn't take DNA. It doesn't take anything but just the frequency of that story. It doesn't even need a white source, a gray source, or a black source. It's just is. So many things are like that. Guys, I need you, if you're young, I need you to know that the MSN was reporting that the Taliban had 200,000 men. And you just heard Jawbreaker, the CIA op, trying to kill bin Laden, admit to you that an army that the MSN reported as 200,000 with a nuclear bomb was about 750 dudes in pickup trucks. Certainly they're dangerous, but to imply that this is a threat to us is retarded psychopathy. It's no different than pretending an invisible cootie virus is running through your veins right now. It's the same Maltese Falcon. The same one. There are no double standards, only footprints and misunderstood motivations. On the left, my friends, is the media and government colluding to protect the CIA's unidentified queen of torture. And on the right is the media and government collu not colluding to protect 2,996 Americans. Why do we believe both? And the answer is denialism. We believe both because it's comfortable. It makes me uncomfortable, but it's comfortable. <laughs> we are comfortable believing, believing that these two things are simultaneously true. Twelve World Network interviews in person with Osama bin Laden. Twelve. The OAN Network... OAN, that's a 
Media Run, Mossad News Network. And it's completely employed by CIA. Uh, actually, it's not always CIA. Sometimes it's just naval intelligence. That that network is built from the ground up as military. Why? Because they had the budget. Because they're like, well, we don't want to fucking try and infiltrate. I don't want to send someone to get a job in this newspaper and then start writing shit. I don't want to do that. Let's just start our own network. And OAN's formed. All that money came from that one PSYOP that I'm not even allowed to talk about. Why do you see what you see on the news? Why do you not see what you don't? Evaluate those crumbs, people. This is a direct quote from Osama bin Laden. And it's because of this quote that I think that you don't even know if the people that introduced his Maltese Falcon were good guys or bad. Because Osama bin Laden tells you this. I tell you, freedom and human rights in America are doomed. The U.S. government will lead the American people and the West in general into an unbearable hell and a choking life. And just yesterday, Al-Qaeda bans vaccines. <laughs> really weird when you wake up and you're like torn torn over who's wrong right this is reality terrorism my friends and it's just just a toe dipped in the shallowest part of this water And you're not going to know who the good guy is. You're not going to know who the bad guy is. Are you going to know who's a prop and who's at play? And that's news. That's information. That's mental warfare. And all of it comes down to that electromagnetic veil I wanted you to picture when we began. And your ability to uh, vet your sources. And I think you'll know that instead of vetting the source, just vet the prop. When you see a prop on stage, you will know right away who gravitates to it, who ignores it, who gets mad when people don't pay attention to it, who tries to deny it exists. And that's the closest you're ever going to find to tracing the fingers, to tracing the strings, to where all this stuff lands. It's the closest you're ever going to get. I think that's all. Yeah. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. This was a thick one for me. It took a long time because of... Uh, just to even see this. It's uh, When I watched all this, I was much younger. And of course, I believed all of it when it was happening. Uh, it was part of why I joined the Navy. This shit's very toxic and... Contagious. It's very contagious. And and watching my own naivete as I put this together, like seriously, I remember having that conversation in my head about, but but CNN was right there. They were right the fuck there. And if this guy's so dangerous, why didn't like the newscaster say, hey, you know what? I don't want to be a journalist anymore. I want to be a vigilante hero. And then shoot him. I wonder, as I watch that, why would I not do that? I mean, he didn't do that, so why wouldn't I do that? It seems like that would be the thing to do. And I told myself, it's because you don't understand, James, because you're little. Because you're a punk and you don't know what's going on. Those guys have ties, James. Those guys have white shirts and credentials, man. They've got credentials. you got to go out and get you some credentials, James. Until then, you should just shut your mouth and just, just try and just pay attention to the news. You don't have to understand. You just have to pay attention. That's, that's how I was brought up. It's how every good cow is brought up, right? And good cows, they make good ice cream, don't they? Yep. Love you guys. Thanks.